that quiet? Keeping in mind that I know people will still be joining as we, we continue. So welcome to those of you who've joined us before. We're excited to have you back. To those of you who are new, um, we are excited to have you. Um, this is our webinar series, Mental Health Support for Healthcare During COVID-19. Um, reminders, this is Zoom, use video if you can. Mute if you're not speaking, although I'll probably forget to do that as well and forget to unmute. And please use chat. Um, chat during, I'm gonna give a little food for thought, chat questions during that. Dr. Wu is gonna be presenting, put, put stuff in the chat for that as well. And then when he's done, we'd, we'd ask you to unmute and we love conversation. Um, we like to build friendships here. So the more that we can see you, hear you, the more we can do that. Next slide, Tani. So reminder, I'm Jody Dvorkin, and I'm going to let my coworker, my little pea in a pod with me, Tani, introduce herself as well, but we'll be help walking you through today's webinar. Tani, you want to say hi? Hi, all. I'm Tani. Good to be here. And so I'm on a Facebook group that does Meme Monday. So this was my favorite one from last week. And I feel like this group of callers would understand. My kids like don't even understand this at all. But um back to the future and yeah i think we'll never set it to 2020 <laughs> in any movie ever again if they make another sequel so this made me laugh i hope it makes you laugh as well <laughs> so quick reminder ICSI has a very strong antitrust policy so if you think that the conversation is veering something of a competitive nature regarding pricing let us know and we'll steer the conversation back always need to remind everybody at the beginning of our webinars and we are super excited today. We have gone national. We are excited to have our friend, Dr. Wu, from the East Coast joining us. Um, Dr. Wu is the director for the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research at Johns Hopkins. Um, has spent a lot of time working on uh, healthcare worker well-being, um, years and years. And so we're excited for him to talk about their RISE program and what they're doing at Johns Hopkins um, for the coronavirus, but also the culture he has put in place there um, which has existed for years and has helped them deal with um, things like the pandemic when it comes up. So we're going to go to him in a couple minutes, but just giving people time to log in still. I have a couple other reminders. So our playbook, mental health playbook, an uh, actionable guide to support our healthcare workers is on our website. You can even just go to ICSI.org and it'll take you there. Um, and it's really a, a culmination of a lot of these conversations. Um, of the talks you have given, um, the conversations you all have had, we kind of tried to put it together and synthesize what we heard um, and try to give a toolkit to help organizations systematically think about how they can su support their workers. Um, and then we add in summaries of all these calls. So we, these presentations, we then have people summarize and we put it at the end so you can really see and have an idea and have a contact information. Oh, I, I heard that, we'd be interested, but I need some help in getting something started. So our goal is to really create a network where everybody can talk to one another and we're excited to expand that network here today and to make it more national and it's been quite regional and, and we, wanna, we wanna go further with that. Upcoming webinars, so um, we're doing them every two weeks. We have Dr. Dyerby from Mayo um, to talk about what they've been doing for their health um, healthcare worker well-being. Um, in particular, they've de developed a very robust bereavement policy, which was new. Um, so we've, she's, we've asked her to share that. Um, in light of COVID, they've made some really important changes. So that will be in two weeks. Um, August 12th is a TBD. I have some things cooking, but I won't, I won't announce it yet. And then Wednesday the 26th, we have Dr. Susan Scott from University of Missouri. And their For You team has also kind of for years focused on physician well-being, starting with kind of medical errors, transitioning over time to include workplace violence and other things, and now working with the pandemic. And then on Wednesday, September 9th, Dr. Jonathan Ripp from uh, Mount Sinai in New York. Um, he's their chief wellness officer and to talk about kind of what they did as they faced the biggest surge um, months ago. And so what they did, what was helpful, what wasn't. So he'll come join us in September. And then this Friday, um, we have our very own Sarah Horst. Um, she does a lot of uh, webinars and training on authentic leadership. So she'll be talking about simple tools to reignite the conversation. Um, really helpful, really practical. Sarah is very funny and engaging. Um, and so please join us this Friday. 
And so just a two, three minute food for thought. So I actually went to Sarah and I said, Sarah, what can I talk about? You know, I really want to talk about how can we maintain a sense of humor or how can we be able to cry? How can we let emotions be emotions? And how do organizations do that? Because it's hard. And how do you kind of acknowledge emotions and create an atmosphere to do that? And she said, I have just the thing. So Sarah is actually doing another training today. So I, I am taking her slides and presenting her work, which I've seen before. And I think it's the idea of temperature checks. It's not just COVID temperature checks, but how do you take a temperature check of your workers. And so to do that, um, one thing is just to get up on the balcony, right? To have a different point of view, get up and see for leaders what's going on, see the movements, see what people are doing. Um, you have to be in it and then you also have to kind of step back and take a broader view of what's going on. And then Sarah has talked a lot on the Mood Elevator, which is a Sen and Delaney thing. We have no affiliation with them. We just think this is a really useful tool but really to ask people, how are you feeling? Um, green reflects more positive emotions, red a little bit more not positive or maybe negative emotions. And then there's curious and interested is more neutral, kind of neutral that can lead you to maybe more positive, but they're more in the middle. Um, and this is a really good way to kind of assess either individually with your coworkers or in a group staff meeting where what people are feeling, recognizing that you can be in the red and the green at the same time in a, in a day, you can be in the green in the morning and the red in the afternoon, but just to understand where people are at and how people start expressing how they're feeling. So the, again, we talked the green zone and the red zone, um, but it is a spectrum, but it gets people out of the, how are you, I'm fine, into how are you, I'm one of these other things that are more specific and really lead you to better understanding how you can help somebody or just listen more authentically to how they're doing. You wanna get past the, I'm fine. You don't have to use the mood elevator, although it's a really good tool and it's helpful, but you can use a, you know, other variations, a rating of one to 10, how are you feeling about this? Weather description, are you stormy? Are you cloudy? Are you a rainbow? I mean, you know, just what, what, what resonates with people? Are you red, yellow, green? I like to express myself in memes. So I'm feeling like my hair's out to here, like I haven't, you know, or whatever it gets people um, to be able to better express how they're feeling. And then there's the meeting after the meeting. Um, and so we like to do this a lot at ICSI. There's the meeting and then there's how did that make people feel and how are they gonna walk away? It's kind of like you wanna know as people leave a meeting in the hallway, what are they actually gonna talk about, right? What are they gonna say and make sure it's not something different than what you heard in the meeting. Next slide, Tan. So important as you have staff meetings, team meetings, as you wrap up, you can think about um, asking people what makes you feel hopeful? What was missing today? Are there concerns or cautions that we should continue on with? Really creating a safe space so that there's no meeting after the meeting that happens in your hallway that you don't know about and that you actually can gauge how people really feel when they're walking away. So we found that to be really useful um, and hoping it could be useful for you too. And so that's our little food for thought today. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, feel free to chat in any questions or if you've used the Mood Elevator um, tips, that would be great. Um, and as Tani pulls up the slide, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Wu. So super excited to have him um, talk about the program that they have at Johns Hopkins. And please feel free to chat and then at the end chime in with questions. Dr. Wu, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh, I, the, I'm going to unmute you, Dr. Wu. <laughs> there we go. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm uh, very grateful to be here. Uh, while not from Minnesota, I did live in Scandinavia for a, for a time. Mm -hmm. So it's almost the same thing. <laughs> and I just came off yesterday, a three hour call with some, which included folks from, the, from Minnesota Community Measurements. Uh, I co-chaired a panel with Chris Norton from uh, Minnesota Community Measurement and Leif Solberg was on. Um, and I even got a greeting from Bevan Yu um, on email who said he might not be able to make it but wanted to, wanted to send greetings. So I'm feeling very welcomed. Um, sort of appropriate to the 
meme of the day. I, I heard uh, a, a little mnemonic to, to remember the, the months uh, because time has really flown and it's 30 days have September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except March, which had 8,000 days. Um, and it really did feel like that. So next slide, please. So I'm going to talk um, about the impacts of the pandemic on the psychological well-being of healthcare workers. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think this is something that you're pretty well aware of. Uh, I'm going to talk about the potential impact on patient care and institutional resilience, which is certainly important. And I'm going to spend a little more time, I think, on reviewing steps that institutions can take to support workers. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that this provokes discussion. I hope to learn some of what you're doing uh, as well. Next, please. So this is a little bit of an idealized picture, not taking, taken in Baltimore, of um, some of the um, accolades and praise that have been heaped on healthcare workers uh, who've been deemed heroes by the media um, and uh, by, by legitimate people as well. And uh, in fact, I will say that there has been newfound respect for doctors, nurses, and, um, and, and, and other people, in fact, uh, some of the perhaps less visible workers in healthcare. Next, please. But things have not always been rosy the, uh, by any means. COVID-19, of course, is the defining health crisis, perhaps for our generation. And uh, this is a shot of um, uh, Times Square. Um, in New York, which has been drained of people and color. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Rip will tell you more about what's happened in, in New York. I actually trained at Mount Sinai, so I'm, uh, I've been hearing quite a bit of what's, what's happening down there. Um, the, the, the necessary response has really strained healthcare staff. It's also created personal risk, which is almost for the first time. Um, for the for all workers, and of course, threaten their emotional well-being. Next, please. Um, there was uh, a terrific piece on this, which was really just an, uh, a news piece in JAMA, um, and they um, and that's where I've taken the the, the photos. But in the short term, um, people have been fearful and anxious for themselves and for their family. They felt insecure and off balance because of role changes. Uh, they've been angry and frustrated almost everywhere because um, things don't always seem, um, uh, all the support does not seem to be there. Um, and there have been, there's been a great deal of anguish and grief over the suffering of, uh, of particularly patients. People have been separated from their natural um, support systems, in some cases their families, in other cases the workers who they, uh, where they used to work as people have been redeployed. And in the longer term, there are real risks for um, developing health conditions, um, including simply the worsening of existing uh, mental health conditions, which all of us are prone to and are, which are quite prevalent, actually maybe even more prevalent in healthcare than they are in the outside world. Next, please. This also poses a threat to the mission of institutions. Distress can be truly disabling. Uh, we've had certainly had workers who have felt, who've said that they felt so anxious they just could not get up out of bed and get to work. Um, this reduces people's performance, leads to absenteeism and also presenteeism, which can be even more toxic um, and really can threaten the ability of the institution to deliver um, what it needs to at this very um, high demand time. Next, please. So I'm going to talk about support in terms of addressing uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, we published a paper recently in the Journal of Patient Safety and Risk Management, uh, which summarizes some of uh, what, I, what I'm uh, going to say. I can actually circulate that 
uh, after I realize I can circulate that after uh, after today. Um, but certainly there are basic needs, uh, more psychological needs, and then needs for self actualization and self fulfillment. I'm not sure how many of how much opportunity they, there really has been for the top of the pyramid, and we've mostly been focusing lower down. Next, please. Um, basic needs are something that we don't think about that much. Because most healthcare workers have uh, most of these things most of the time, but food, sleep, rest, and exercise have actually been in somewhat short supply um, at, at our place and others. Uh, there have been many uh, efforts to step things up. Um, we've had meals for heroes, uh, for people taking care of COVID patients. There have been there was a huge donation of food from people in the community. Um, one one of my neighbors donated a cake to our incident command center every uh, every week, um, and we've provided hotel rooms even for some of our busiest workers who uh, were afraid to go home to their families. New demands have emerged. Uh, who knew that shopping would be as stressful as it currently is? Uh, people's transportation was cut off. They were unable to take mass transit. Um, and some of those are some of our uh, least well-paid workers and were needed to drive and this caused expense. People had childcare expenses, particularly if their schedules changed and they needed to work on weekends, whereas previously not. And then there was also that thing about schools being closed. Uh, people had trouble and spent a lot of their waking hours out of the hospital looking for groceries and toilet paper, which was not productive time spent. And in the end, uh, we wound up providing free parking, providing shuttles to drive people to and from work, providing free child care uh, for some of our workers and selling groceries in the hospital so that uh, people could simply pick them up on their way out the door. Uh, I think that those things were they seem small, but they were certainly appreciated. Next. Worker safety, of course, is crucial, and I'm not going to talk much about this, but um, uh, providing personal protective equipment was not always optimal in all hospitals. I think we did, a, we had a, a terrific supply chain effort, um, which started in January before um, COVID actually even reached the U.S., and we're well prepared. But um, also, how to use it properly and making sure it was used properly um, is crucial. Uh, creating the protocols and rules, which sometimes changed by the day, um, and then figuring out who should be tested and wh when, and communicating that to people. I think that the lack of information was, pr was profoundly anxiety-provoking, um, and providing the informational support was analogous to providing emotional support in many cases. Uh, next, please. And this was and part of the uh, part of our um, response wound up being centered on communicating adequately and appropriately. This is a shot actually of uh, about half of our uh, consolidated um, incident command center, which had. Um, at, at the peak had probably 30 people sitting in it at all times for, for our whole health system. It, it really looked like a little bit of a war room. Um, but uh, we thought, thought it was very important to communicate as quickly and, and freely as possible to get messages out to um, the, the, the most distant workers or the hardest to work, hardest to reach workers, including people in the sub basements who normally don't get a lot of information, honestly, from, um, from the, th the top ranks. Um, regular leadership is not exactly uh, analogous to crisis leadership. And uh, we have, in fact, uh, created a, a, a online course on the principles of uh, crisis leadership. The, a fact, a physiologic fact is that the fight or flight state that people find themselves in when they're petrified for their own lives diminishes their ability to think rationally and decreases their ability and willingness to accept authority. This, this kind of pushback can be very detrimental to making things happen. And some of the messages that we have published about, um, we actually published something quite early 
in, in April in the Annals of Internal Medicine on crisis communications. And um, uh, we found that the, one of the first principles is to actually listen, to normalize people's feelings, to communicate, communicate often and honestly. Um, in fact, if things are not going well, just to say so, to provide a clear and optimistic vision and plan and to focus on group cohesion as much as possible. Next, please. Um, in March, we uh, formed a coordinating committee on staff support, which wound up being coordinated by our Office of Wellbeing and our medical director for well-being and our nursing director of well-being uh, participated in this. But in addition to this, our, uh, our wellness program, um, uh, which is called Healthy at Hopkins, spiritual care, which is in the hospital at all times, um, our uh, uh, staff assistance faculty and staff assistance program, which is called support and our department of psychiatry all participated and uh, prominently featured were, was our rise program which stands for resilience in stressful events and i will talk just a little bit more about that the group began meeting um uh, uh actually for, had its initial meeting we realized that um that staff support was going to be crucial um, uh, we are fortunate that um, our incident command, our incident commanders felt oh, Looks like we're having a little... If it is not... Oh, am I back? Can you yes. hear me? You're oh. back, but I think we missed a little bit of what you just said. If you could restate, oh, please. I was just saying, uh, a red ball issue is in a, in um, aviation is something which is discovered, which if it is not attended to, could cause catastrophic failure of the mission. And uh, uh, staff support and well-being was uh, the number one red ball issue on our board in the command center for the entire hundred days that we met. Um, and uh, they, uh, the, uh, our office, uh, our, our group uh, reported daily to the command center about the status of what kinds of support were being uh, used and what the messages were coming from the front line. Uh, next, please. So what we wound up developing was a continuum of staff support, which ranged all the way from our Office of Well-Being and Healthy at Hopkins. These are things that normally include um, uh, yoga at noon and taking a walk on Monday afternoons and uh, eating healthy, um, healthily, particularly if you've got diabetes or weight loss. Um, these uh, uh, um, activities became much more popular. Um, spiritual care, um, which is multi very multi-denominational, wound up playing an important role in providing support, and they were one of the groups that was actually in the hospital live. Um, at times, our pastors and others would uh, papper up and, uh, and go into the uh, into the COVID units in full protective gear to provide support to people, particularly around bereavement. Um, my support, which was uh, which is really a half dozen therapists who generally help people with problems, a lot of which have to do with family issues and uh, substance dependency and others, um, went completely virtual online, um, but expanded their phone um, access and uh, would take a call from anyone 24 hours a day, including family members, which I think was wound up being very important. Uh, the Department of Psychiatry. Entry, um, which is historically had um, had a real backlog in being able to see staff ex expeditiously. Um, you could never get an appointment, basically. With psychiatry, um, added extra staff. Many of their inpatient psychiatrists and uh, psych nurses were not um, seeing patients in the hospital because the units had been emptied out, and uh, so they added space so that they could see someone on an essentially walk-in basis. And we created triage rules so that my support and others could get um, 
people to the appropriate level of support uh, whenever they called. Uh, RISE, which is uh, resilience in stressful events, um, also increased um, its, uh, its services. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And next, uh, so uh, we created a uh, dedicated website uh, or page on the Office of Wellbeing site, which provided uh, information about COVID support, including basic needs, mental, emotional, and spiritual support, which we called MESH. We originally called it MESS, but we decided that MESH might uh, be more appropriate and H was for health. Um, there's a program uh, with our with the Peabody Institute, our um, our conservatory, uh, which provided music um, uh, during the uh, on demand, and there were resources for doing physical activities, um, including online yoga and exercise classes. At some at one point, um, six hundred people a day were doing online yoga, which I think is a is a world's record. Um, prop, not even for Baltimore, but perhaps for, uh, you know, I don't know if, if, if 600 people anywhere, at any institution are doing yoga three times a day. Next, please. Um, Healthy at Hopkins, um, uh, besides their wellness programs, which all went virtual, um, expanded basic support, including providing childcare resources and food. Um, at one point, uh, the program was, was supplying at least 2,000 meals a day to, uh, to staff who are working in the hospital. It's a big health system um, of, uh, you know, of total, in total, we probably have 45,000 healthcare workers. So um, it, it, it's, it's five local hospitals and, and a big enterprise, but um, uh, people were very grateful for what uh, Healthy at Hopkins was providing. Next, please. Um, again, spiritual care um, uh, really stepped up that what they were doing, and they were obviously well known to staff from um, uh, other um, crises in which they'd intervened. And um, every one of the people on that uh, that Hollywood Square slide that I showed, I realize that slide looks more like a Zoom call than anything, but uh, we began meeting. We met first once. Um, at our peak, we were meeting seven times a week, um, every day and twice on Tuesdays and Thursdays to try to coordinate what we were doing, come up with our protocols, monitor what was working and not, and develop new programs. Next, please. So RISE is uh, resilience in stressful events. And uh, uh, I'm happy to see Sue Scott on your list of uh, of speakers, Sue is, is a, a great friend and a colleague. We are actually working together currently on several projects. And our program, RISE, is related to the program that she has, which is called For You. Um, our program has been ex in existence since 2011, and it is a cadre of, initially, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, 35 trained, uh, staff members, all of whom are clinicians one way or the other, um, who have been trained in psychological first aid um, and, um, and simply providing uh, peer support. These are people who know what it's like to work in the hospital so that when people call, there isn't a long exposition needed to explain why it was so uh, distressing that a child um, developed a brain tumor and had a bad outcome. Um, it's, you can get right into it. Um, the uh, group is on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and responds to calls, uh, is pledged to respond to calls within 30 minutes. Um, our res actual response time is closer to 11 minutes, and we meet face-to-face -face with people individually or in groups. This was done, um, uh, we continue to meet face-to-face -face during the pandemic, and uh, though we also expanded to doing some things by phone and some things on Zoom, which in some cases was less successful, in some cases was terrifically successful, especially if people, we could persuade people to turn on their cameras and, uh, and, and, and face us. Uh, we, we, adapt, we made some adaptations, um, including training additional support members. We trained um, uh, 
at, on, on one occasion, 21 psychiatric nurses um, who were a bit idle and who certainly had the skills to do this. In fact, they perhaps had too many skills. We had to convince them not to try to do therapy when answering a simple call. Uh, we began to round proactively on units and on and most weeks we rounded on every unit in the hospital um, to, to, to see how people were doing, uh, particularly when things were changing, units were being converted um, and reconstructed to be COVID units, people were being redeployed, uh, or when there was the risk or actual infection that uh, happened in the hospital. In the end, we expanded our team to 71 uh, responders. Um, and at the peak, we had uh, all of those people deployed in the hospital, um, res either responding face-to-face -face or answering calls. And the, the group wound up doing more uh, business than in the, in the last 100 days than we have, um, that we had ever in history. Previously, we'd taken perhaps on average maybe three or four calls a week um, and, and supporting maybe a dozen people. Um, over the last, uh, over the first 10 weeks of the uh, pandemic, we supported, we took calls and supported something like 2,500 people um, individually and uh, felt like we were perhaps doing some good. Uh, this, incidentally, this um, program is being um, disseminated by the Maryland Patient Safety Center, which is the PSO of, for Maryland. And uh, RISE has trained other programs, other hospitals, to perform, um, uh, to develop and um, implement teams that are RISE-like um, in their hospitals. And we actually have, uh, we've been, we had an increased number of uh, requests during the pandemic. We wound up doing training online, which we never do. We always do it face-to-face. -face. But we have now trained, I think, uh, at least in part, um, something close to 40 hospitals around the country. Next, please. Uh, much of what we do is psychological first aid. Uh, George Everly is a faculty member in uh, psychiatry, and uh, he has developed uh, a kind of psycho a version of psychological first aid called rapid psychological first aid. Um, this, he comes by this honestly as he was one of the developers of psychological first aid and critical incident stress management. Um, and he has a course which is free on Coursera. If you put in Everly or psychological first aid, this will come up. Um, the course has been taken now, I haven't checked recently, but it's probably been taken by 200,000 people in the last 10 weeks um, all, all around the world. And this can be done free. The total time to, to take the course is, I think, something close to eight hours. Um, uh, and uh, it is free, though if you would like to obtain a certificate, you can pay, I think, $49 uh, and, and earn a certificate as well. Next, please. Um, as I said, my support um, uh, expanded their um, resources radically to provide phone assistance to both staff and families. And the unique advantage they have had is that they would speak to family members, which is something that none of the other um, resources were really uh, empowered to do by the, by the health system or by risk management or by, by anybody else. Uh, next, please. Psychiatry, as I said, increased there. They created a, a COVID uh, rapid a clinic for frontline healthcare workers um, and wound up seeing um, a, quite an increase in um, calls from people who had existing issues, who might have been taking an antidepressant, who might have had um, been seen for anxiety or, uh, or depression. Um, they began uh, to create uh, groups um, which uh, were initially in some of the ICUs and in the emergency department and were um, uh, organized to have homogeneous groups, for example, for nurses, for doctors, for, for residents, um, for respiratory techs, um, to um, uh, allow them an outlet. Uh, we have all begun to refer to psychiatry when necessary and came up with fairly detailed protocols for referral to, so that we can do that safely. 
Um, next, please. A lot of what we have been doing has been informed by a um, by this uh, phase chart of, of psychological response to disaster. This was um, a, a adapted from um, uh, so, uh, some resources from uh, from SAMHSA um, and uh, 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 further developed by Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Everly and uh, with, with uh, some assistance from the rest of us. Um, it charts emotional highs and emotional lows that occur in response to any major disaster. And this was developed over the last three or four decades based on previous um, disasters, most of which were not pandemics, um, but were Hurricane Katrina or an earthquake or a tsunami. Um, in some cases, though, responses to, to SARS and H1N1 um, and Ebola in more um, isolated uh, set, epi um, sorry, in epidemic rather than pandemic forms. Um, the, um, the phases are, seem to be quite predictable, and we have seen that they apply both to individuals and to groups um, in our own experience. The initial phase is an impact phase, and even before that, there is a pre-impact phase. When people know that some that know that the disaster is coming, know that the patients are about to arrive, when they know that their unit, which was previously a um, a pediatric um, cancer unit and was is now henceforth going to be a COVID intensive care unit, when they realize that this is coming, they um, have some uh, predictable responses, including disbelief, anger, fear, and a lot of anxiety. Um, their mood de decreases um, uh, until the patient's first hit, and, and this is the impact phase, but then people rally, and there's a little bit of a heroic phase when people um, realize that things are perhaps not as bad as they imagine. Things are never as bad as you imagine, I think. And uh, they work together, they find new solutions, there's a feeling of, uh, of cohesion in the group, um, and you can even achieve a honeymoon phase. People feel uh, altruistic um, and literally hero heroic. They, there's a lot of high-fiving. People are running on adrenaline. We can do this. Um, and actually, people feel uh, like they're accomplishing, accomplishing something. Thereafter, and this is perhaps after the peak passes, um, uh, there, we, uh, mood tends to... D diminish into a long phase of disillusionment, which includes um, uh, perhaps a lessening of resources, as we've seen as the pandemic has receded a little bit in its first wave, at least in, in our part of the country. Um, people uh, feel like um, the support that they had was is now gone. They are tired. They do not feel perhaps as recognized and rewarded as previously. They begin to get cynical, disappointed, angry, depressed. Uh, and this is the time when suicides begin to occur. And this is, in fact, corresponded quite closely to what happened in New York. Um, and this phase can last for quite some time. So the need for support, um, even though uh, it may be appearing to be diminishing in some cases, there's more anger and there really is uh, still a great deal of need for support that is uh, just not quite so easy to see. Uh, gradually, uh, people work through this, and uh, at some point, you enter a phase of restoration, but this disillusionment phase could last for some time. It could last for months. It could last for a year, and uh, we haven't figured that out yet. Uh, we have done some of our planning based on this, and um, uh, we, we feel like our institution really is in this disillusionment phase. Uh, when people are actually feeling a little betrayed, look, I worked so hard for you, and now what do I get? Now we've got cutbacks furloughs, um, we're not getting all the recognition and love that we got before. Next, please. So um, here we are. This is um, a, um, a montage of photos which were put up outside of the medical ICU at Hopkins. And you, as you can see, there's still a lot of um, emotion and a lot of um, solidarity and um, a lot of pride in the work that's being done. Um, people have done heroic work and um, are continuing to be called upon to do the work, though perhaps 
the recognition has fallen off a bit. Um, I think that there has really been a remarkable response to the, the pandemic, and I think that uh, there are a lot of congratulations um, which are due to, to many, many people all around, including some of the workers who are in general less visible. We provided support and heard messages from a number of people who we had never ever talked to before, at least Raz had never talked to before, people um, in, who work in security, in the laundry, in food service, in facilities management. Um, uh, these, are, these are people who generally do not call um, and uh, perhaps don't feel like they can call, perhaps don't feel empowered to call, and uh, are, are more or less invisible. They were really frontline workers and were much more visible. The transporters were putting themselves at risk every day um, and had anxieties and had less information than, um, than the nurses and the doctors who were on email and reading, reading the plasma screens constantly. Um, so we have uh, increased our efforts to get information from those workers and to also provide more support proactively, perhaps through different channels. And that's um, something that we are, uh, one of the lessons that we have learned. Next, please. So in summary, um, uh, the staff um, uh, have been, staff who are, are caring for people with COVID have been anxious and fearful, off balance and um, lacking in support. They've had a lot of emotions um, and it's clear that healthcare institutions should support both their basic needs and their well-being. This is important for, of course, for the health of the workers, but it's also, if, if, there, if we can talk about self-interest, it's in the interest of the institutions so that they can execute the missions that they are um, uh, charged with. So um, I, I, we feel that it is important to provide a continuum of staff support. No single one of the resources is sufficient. Uh, we have, uh, we're, we're fairly, um, uh, our, our leadership in the event is fairly uh, satisfied or happy with, with um, what the institution has been able to do. And we heard um, almost daily from the very top, from very top leadership about the importance of what we're doing, including our vice president for medical affairs and the dean, the president of the hospital, the, uh, the director of nursing and others. Um, it, uh, the next slide, please. Um, here's a quote, a fundamental key to addressing a crisis is for leaders not only to be honest about the situation and what you're, they're gonna do about it, but to do so with clarity humility and heart so as to remind people that we're in this together. And um, I'm, uh, I think we've got some time to take questions. I'm also happy to talk to people on email. And if you're dying to follow one more person on Twitter, I'm a fairly frequent Twitterer. Uh, I'm with you, Dr. Wu uh, on Twitter. So thank you very much and, and very happy to, to take questions, which I, I see at least a couple. Jody, do you want to drive uh, the uh, the chat or or, or or Tani? That would be great. Yeah, so thank you. That was fantastic. I, I have some questions myself, but I'm going to defer to the group first. So, Dr. Either, are you on the line? Would you like to kind of speak up and ask your question? Otherwise, I, I can do it for you. No, oh, I'm on the line. Hi, Albert. Hey. Nice to see you. Um, I was wondering if... Uh, not only in response to the immediate situation, but if you had some recommendations for how we can both educate people, change our educational programs, and potentially our orientation as we bring people into our organizations so that they may be better prepared to deal with uncertainty. It runs a little counter to one of our mainstream um, maybe unintended consequences of education that we're creating experts and people that often view themselves as authority. And I was wondering if you had some ideas and recommendations about how we can help people see themselves in relationship to that quote that you ended with. Yeah, great question. We have some things that we are trying to disseminate. Um, currently, we have developed a, 
Um, I've, I've got a manuscript that I can actually also circulate. We have developed sort of 10 commandments for crisis leadership and staff support um, about how to communicate um, more effectively in a crisis and how to deal, uh, uh, deal with it. I think this applies as well to any level of leader, including um, a supervisor, an educator, um, a, a chief resident, a resident supervising students. Um, and um, I think that humility is key. I think that we learn too much that we should keep a stiff upper lip, that it's the patient that has the problem. Um, I think that something we have to realize is that, um, you know, if, if we suddenly lose cabin pressure, you know, put the oxygen on yourself first. You know, we need to be well in order to have the extra resources that are needed to take care of other people. And, um, and I think that that is not something we are taught and not something that many people accept. Um, so I don't have any huge insights into it, but we are trying to convey, um, among other things, that it is not a sign of weakness to ask for help, but it's a sign of strength to ask for help. And if you don't know, uh, the, only thing, the only thing you can do wrong is not ask. Uh, we've, we, uh, our RISE program is part of orientation for new house staff, so at least we're doing that at, at, at that level. But we are now training all of our managers in nursing on this crisis, using this crisis leadership uh, curriculum. And with trepidation, we are about to start doing it with a medical faculty. Thank you. Shanna, can I have you, um, if you're on the line, do you wanna ask about the, the timeline? Sure, I, I was uh, very interested in the, the phases of psychological response to disaster slide that you had. Um, and I've seen a, a number of different things that, that look like that. I just wondered if there is a typical timeline in terms of like weeks or months, you know, in terms of those division and, and the times, or if it varies more by disaster or what, you, what else you may have to say about that? Yeah, great question. Um, the, uh, I think it really does vary by disaster and each disaster has its own tempo. And it, it, so it depends on you know, whether the earthquake hits and is done um, or whether or not the pandemic rolls on and on. Um, to some extent, there always is an initial impact but um, that can be very that can be relatively short. Uh, we have, we've seen this in some way play out on individual units at different times. Um, you know, sort of during the same month, um, our infection control staff was very busy, very stressed. A lot was asked of them, and they were working very hard to develop protocols for a month before anyone else was doing anything. Um, and by the time the first cases arrived, they were already burning out because um, they'd been running hard for, you know, really for 15 hours a day for, uh, for a month. Uh, um, some of the ICUs we've seen, we, we would see people um, saying all sorts of crazy things, um, which really re represented anxiety. Um, and then within days after the patients arrived, um, you know, sort of begin to regain confidence and become... Um, you know, and more upbeat. Um, and so, yeah, I think it really does vary by situation. Jody, can I ask just a quick follow-up to that? Sure thing. Okay, um, this is Shanna again. Um, so given that, you know, in a pandemic situation where it could be a year or more, um, that's, a, that's a long time for that graph to span. Do you, would you anticipate people going, kind of moving back to a, a place or kind of some movement in between, or would you expect it to still follow those same curves? Yeah, you know, again, um, we have also seen, uh, this is, you know, this is an, uh, a conceptual model rather than, you know, sort of a blueprint. And we have seen people cycle back and forth a little bit. Uh, well, early uh, after um, in hospital in infection control, uh, was was feeling quite was look, sounding quite despondent. Um, they rallied and came back, back um, and only to become. Um, I think right about now they're starting to feel down again. So I think that these cycles can repeat. Fantastic, thank you. 
Carrie from Children's, did you have a question? Yeah, um, Dr. Wu, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your deployment methodology with your RISE supporters. So how is it that, what's the connection? Is it just a phone call? So I guess the first part, how do people contact you and then how do you deploy supporters to these individuals? Um, yeah, this is, I'd be happy to talk about it at greater length, but basically we have a pager and more importantly, we have an electronic pager because so there's actually a phone page you can use um, which um, rings to the cell phones of uh, the responders who are on call. Um, there's always two people on call at least but we have many teams and so there are essentially a dozen people on call at any given time for backup. Um, we then uh, the uh, electronic pager goes to a group page um, and people can discuss who is going to take the call and who, if someone is in house at a given time, or if someone's in house in the middle of the night, can they take? Are they better better suited to take the call? So there's a lot of negotiation. Fantastic. There's a, there's a, there's an on call rotation. Um, we had previously been on call for a week at a time. We've actually gone to being on call from for a uh, for a day at a time, because sometimes some in some weeks we've talked to a hundred people. Oh. And how many peer supporters do you have currently? We currently have, I think it's 71 peer responders. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna go ahead and just ask the next two to help with time, but um, you know, wondering about the involvement of social workers, that this um, mentioning that we've talked about nurses, doctors, psychologists, what about social workers in your program? So social workers are among other things, members of RISE. So our RISE responders are doctors, nurses, social workers, a chaplain, an emergency medical technician, a respiratory technician, um, all, all sorts of different kinds of people. Um, social workers um, are, we, we don't have a social worker per se, a director of social work um, on our mesh, in our mesh group per se, but um, I think that they're pretty well, they're their point of view is represented, uh, again, because it's quite a multidisciplinary group. And can you share some tips regarding providing virtual psychological first aid to groups? You know, virtual is harder, any, any suggestions? It's tricky. I mean, I think that my one tip is to try to get people to turn on their cameras um, because um, it's, um, it, the absence of feedback makes it much more difficult to to provide support uh, and to know that it is being received, um, and also to re to you know to be empathetic. I think that uh, fit, you know the, the the statistic is at least fifty percent of communication is probably nonverbal, and uh, when you're on a blank uh, you know Zoom call, uh, you're missing half the opportunity to figure out if you're doing anything worthwhile. Fantastic. Any other questions? Jody, this is Claire. Can I ask a question? Sure thing. Hi, Dr. Wu. I'm Claire Neely. I'm the president of ICSI, and thank you very much for taking oh, time to do this. I'm curious because we're dealing with the COVID crisis. We're also dealing with the Black Lives Matter crisis, and that certainly affects how we care for our patients, but it also affect, it's affecting the staff. And so I'm curious about how you're when bleeding that into what you're doing. Yeah, we, we've been, we've had a hard time with this um, because uh, we do not feel like we are experts on, um, you know, on racism or anti-racism. Um, and uh, while we, I think we are, on the other hand, good listeners. So what we have done to this point when we have had calls acutely about people who are upset, we had a call about someone who was upset because a, another staff member posted some hateful, um, something hateful on Facebook, um, and it became public before it was taken down. And this was very hurtful and they were, they were truly aggrieved. And so we provided support for that. Um, for doing things prospectively, um, we have deferred to some extent to our Office of um, Equity and Inclusion, um, who, is, uh, who are more skilled and who've been thinking about some of these issues for um, you know, for, for a long time and have more content expertise anyway. We have accompanied them to, to some listening sessions um, to provide simply sort of backup support 
uh, we actually did something quite similar with success with hospital uh, epidemiology and infection control. They would provide the message about what the right thing to do was, and then we would provide some support as people might be upset or confused uh, about uh, or angry about what the message was that they were receiving. Thank you. And Dr. Wu, I want to be mindful of time. I have one last question. You've had such good um, support and reaction, a lot of good uptake of your programs, right? 600 people doing yoga, thousands of people calling in. And on previous webinars, we've talked about it being hard actually to get people to call a warm line and get people to ask for help. How do you think you've been so successful? You know, I don't know. I mean, at, at our peak, we were getting uh, to all of our various support mechanisms, we were probably getting 2,000 uh, calls a, a week. So we were, uh, again, this is across a few, a couple of hospitals, but it's, um, but still it was, it was impressive. And uh, we still feel like the majority of people who needed help were not calling. So, um, but, but all the same, I think we did okay. Uh, I think that the, there are two things were helpful. One was the culture has gradually been shifting over the last nine years to the point where it has become more commonplace for um, people to get trained to provide psychological first aid, for people to do RISE training, even if they weren't ever gonna work on, on our team, um, to get it as part of um, their orientation to, to programs. Um, and uh, secondly, we've had a lot of support from top leadership, the president of the hospital, the president of the health system, um, the, uh, the alumni magazine, the internal publications, the dean of the health system have all been trumpeting the, the benefits of RISE in particular for some time. Uh, we won an award for, before, uh, for clinical excellence, which is odd because we're not clinical uh, last year, but it was one of the highest awards that they give in the health system and they just thought we were helping. So I think it's been a process. Um, and uh, the more you can do, the more people will, you know, take advantage. Yeah. Well, this has been terrific. We're so grateful to have you come and talk. And um, I think you've gained some new Twitter followers. I definitely um, am one of them. And we will give your resources and certainly post for people who are interested in trainings or the other resources that you've, you've shared in your presentation, we'll share with others as well. So thank you for coming. Hopefully maybe um, we can have you back as this evolves to hear what's changed or what you're doing differently, but um, appreciate this perspective and, and just thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You, you've, got, you've got a great group. I'm, I'm, uh, I wish I could talk to you all the time. Yeah. Thank you, and, and thank you all for joining. Thank Come you. back and join us in two weeks. We'll uh, have Dr. Dyerbeyer from Mayo, and uh, we'll share the resources as a follow-up email after this session, and feel free to contact us in between and to contact one another. Have a good week, everybody. Thank Take you care. all. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you all.